We are going to be in Luke chapter 8, so if you have your Bible, you want to follow along there in your scripture sheet. You have the passages we'll look at in our time in God's Word. They'll be on the screen as well this morning. We read again from the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the sower. This is our third installment in this four-part series. We pick up at verse 4. When a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then the interpretation provided at verse 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. This is the word of God. And as I said, our third study in this parable in the day, we're going to look at uh, the third variety of soil or gospel hearer, the one that we would call the thorny ground hearer. Now to set the scene, Jesus is preaching to a colossal crowd by way of a parable. He uses the earthy, earthy to teach us of the heavenly. He says, a sower went out to sow seed. A sower tossed some seed onto the earth, and it fell in four distinct locations. The seed, we're told, is the Word of God, the message of the gospel. The sower is anybody that proclaims that message. It could be Jesus. It could be you. It could be me. The soil represents men's heart, and what we have here is the case history of four seeds, all identical, each tossed by the same sower, but each has a different destiny. One falls on the trodden path and becomes food for the birds. Another falls on rocky soil. It grows up quickly, but soon withers and dies. And then the third is the thorny soil. We're going to look at that one today. And then next Sunday, we'll look at the good soil, the, the goody hearer. Each of these soils represents, again, a type of gospel hearer. The roadside hearer, Rhodey, as we called him, rejects the word of Christ and has no response to it. Rocky, however, receives it with joy, but in time of trial, he withers and dies and falls away from the faith. The other two, Thorny and Goody, we are yet to cover. We are looking at each one of these individually, but remember the main lesson of the parable is that the state of the soil determines the fate of the seed. The state of the soil determines the fate of the seed, and interpreted, this means that one's response to the message of God's Word is determined by the state of one's heart. You have a heart condition. All of you do. It is described somewhere in this parable. It is revealed by your response when you encounter the Word of the living God. How do you respond? In which category of hearer do you find yourself? Jesus would like you to ask and answer that critical question even this very day and to do so with deep judgment day honesty. Don't play games with Jesus. He is not playing games with you. He's addressing you by his word through the centuries. He's addressing you by his Holy Spirit even in this very day hour. It is his word we have opened, and he cries out to us, saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
So we approach soil number three by looking briefly at the facts and the interpretation provided. The facts of the thorny soil here are given in verse 7. Seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. There is in Palestine, where Jesus spoke, a very common weed, which you and I would probably think of really as a thorn bush. It grows wild like uh, any weed would grow. But when it is found in a farmer's field, it is a menace to the crops. The farmer may deal with that in a couple of ways. He may move through his field chopping the thorns down, or he may burn them before he plants his seed. But often, when the plant is chopped or burned, the the root system remains in the soil intact, or the seeds from the previous year remain in the soil. And when in 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 the springtime, the seed or the grain of corn is planted in that field, it is not there alone. As Jesus puts it, the thorns grew up with it. Alongside the crop grows the weed. The result? (laughs) The thorns win. The crop plant never bears fruit because the nutrients it needs, the moisture and, and the light, they are consumed by the weeds. Luke says it is choked. Matthew says it yielded no fruit. It may not have died altogether. We can't really be sure about that. It likely remained as a stalk in the field, but it was worthless to the farmer. That much we know, and those are the facts of the parable. Now the interpretation is provided for us in verse 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. So you'll notice this about Thorny. He hears the word. Apparently, he makes some sort of favorable response. The plant does grow up. However, certain items arise which are to the word of God as thorns are to good seed. The thorns uh, represents three things, we're told. The worries of this life, Mark refers to it as worries of the world. Secondly, riches, Mark adds the term deceitfulness of, the deceitfulness of riches. Thirdly, there are the pleasures of this life. And that phrase, of this life, that could modify all three. The worries of this life, the riches of this life, the pleasures of this life. These are the thorns which we are told choke. They cut off the supply of nutrients to the soil and to the soul so that the thorny ground hearer brings no fruit to maturity. Now that phrase may lead you to think that it brings forth fruit that is somehow underdeveloped, but apparently not. Mark says thorny is simply unfruitful and brings forth no crop at all. The emphasis at the end of verse 14 is not on the word maturity, it is on the term no fruit. The purpose of the sower is never realized. The stalk, it may remain in the field, but so what? On the farm that I grew up on, and I grew up on an 80-acre mostly cattle farm, but we did have pecan trees, or pecan trees, or however you say that word. We had, we had those trees at our farm, but let me tell you, uh, they, they were there the entire time that we lived there, but never did we get a single pecan from those trees. They, they survived the winters, but never produced anything that was edible. They were completely worthless. And so is the thorny ground plant and the parallel in the gospel here. The fruit here represents a life of righteousness lived by faith unto the glory and the pleasure of God. Spiritual fruit is described throughout the New Testament. It is The fruits of God's presence in the soul of a man or a woman, the fruits of righteousness. We're told about love and joy and peace and self-control. Praise to God among them. These thorny displayed not at all. Now one of the questions to be faced as we consider this portion of the parable is whether or not thorny represents a truly converted, saved man or woman or not? Is thorny bound for heaven? From the parable alone, there's no clear answer, but from the rest of Scripture, I do believe we can find one, and the answer to that is that thorny is, in fact, not a heaven-bound Christian. First, 
Thorny is called thorny because that is his primary condition. The good soil, the good soil may have had a few weeds in it, but still its primary mark is goodness. Is thorny ground good ground? It would seem not. It is contrasted here with the good ground. Would Jesus refer to someone who has been saved, who has been converted, who has been changed by him as being thorny as opposed to being good? Secondly, it is doubtful that thorny is meant to portray a saved man or woman because the final point made about thorny is that he bears no fruit. Elsewhere in Scripture, it says that anyone failing to bear fruit is headed to destruction. If we had an hour, we could uh, overkill this with some proof texting. But let me point, uh, point you to a few clear statements in Scripture. One is in Matthew seven nineteen: Every tree that does not bear good fruit, what happens to it? It is cut down and thrown into the fire. So that seems pretty clear. You don't bear good fruit, you're thrown into <coughs> the fire. John 15 <coughs> is a passage many of us are familiar with. <coughs> there the Lord says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is, there it is again, thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So the one who abides in Christ bears fruit. The one who does not abide in Christ is cast away because he is fruitless. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. And here I would appeal to the end and purpose of our salvation, which is fruit bearing. Jesus calls us to bear fruit and Jesus gets what he aims for. If you don't bear fruit, you are not his work. Finally, back to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 9, from the words of the, uh, John the Baptist, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees, so every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There it is again, hardly a fitting description of one who is bound for eternal bliss in the presence of, of the Lord. So that seems like enough. The Bible says that the fruitless are cut down and cast into the fire, thrown away. Thorny bears no fruit, never fulfills the purpose of the sower or the potential of the seed. So the difference between goody on the one hand and thorny on the other is not just how much blessing you're going to receive when you meet the Lord in glory, but whether or not you are ever going to be in glory at all. And, and, and that possibly will affect your attitude towards thorny's description but really it should not. I'm afraid some of you want to know whether you can be a thorny and still get by. You want to know whether you can pursue the lust of the world and be cool with God. You're looking to figure out if you can have it both ways. Scripture would suggest not. But besides, your attitude is not good. No, no. The point of Jesus to you in this parable is Seek to be good soil. Don't be rody. Don't be rocky. Don't be thorny. Receive the word and bear fruit. And if that is not your desire, if that is not your goal, if that is not your quest, can you truly say that you are walking today in saving grace? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And we're ready now to move on to the lessons of this portion of the parable. Lesson number one. Lesson number one for today, do not be damned by the innocent. Don't be damned by the innocent. The story of Thorny teaches us that it is possible to be, in a sense, damned by that which in itself is harmless. Thorns, weeds in your field, they, they don't hurt you. They aren't usually poisonous. In and of themselves, these Plants are innocent. They represent the worries, the riches, the pleasures of this world. These two are in themselves perfectly innocent. You think about these, the worries. Uh, it may be the cares uh, of this life. The person who experiences some cares about life is really just a responsible human being, right? It's the, uh, the addict or the drunkard. 
who hasn't a care in the world except where to get the next fix. And when he finds that, he has no cares, no worries. That's why he wants his fix. That's why he wants his bottle, to get rid of those cares to the responsible man, to the responsible woman who is concerned to provide for his or her family. Well, you have cares. If you're a father today, happy Father's Day. But being a father suggests that you have cares in this life. Having cares is part and parcel of living a responsible adult life. First Peter 5 and verse 7, we as believers are admonished to cast our cares upon the Lord. It assumes that we are going to have these things called cares. So in and of themselves, the worries of this life, they're completely innocent. The same could be said of riches and pleasures. Nothing wrong with plenty of resources. Nothing wrong with having a good time within the boundaries of God's law. These are gifts from God to be enjoyed in and of themselves. Once again, I say they are innocent, but the sober warning of the parable is that they can get out of control and become destructive. As some have said wisely, a good good makes a bad God. Things that are perfectly fine in themselves become idolatrous and destructive. So God's work of grace in a man or a woman will result in these three concerns being subjected to the claims of Christ and the good of one's soul. So in a natural person, an unconverted person, these worries, riches, pleasures invariably compete with Christ's claims and work against the good of one's soul. The innocent becomes, through sin, the destroyer of spiritual health. Do you see my point? You can be damned by the innocent all the time saying, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? And you don't see how certain things are sucking life out of your soul. The worries of this life How will I feed my children? How will I take care of my family? Where will I get my clothes? Where will I find shelter for my body? Do you worry about those things? Honestly, no, you don't. (laughs) Your worries uh, are a little more refined, what we tend to call first world worries. You you worry about uh, how sharp your clothes look today. Uh, You worry about where you can get the best sushi in town. You worry about how my house looks for the company. I wonder if the Steelers are going to have a good good season. I, I, I wonder if Dana likes me or doesn't. How's the stock market doing this week? Again, I ask, are these things wrong? No. But you get so wrapped up in this trivial stuff, you have no emotion left to care about what God thinks or to care about how it's going with your soul. The riches of life, oh my. Uh, Worries have slain their thousands, riches their ten thousands. Did Jesus ever warn us about loving money? (laughs) Frequently he did. But the classic text, interestingly, is from the writings of Paul to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7. Look at that with me. We have brought nothing into this world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And and I ask, how can you say it any better than that? Innocent riches hungered after excessively, result in spiritual destruction. And so the next verse, we're admonished, flee. (laughs) Flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. That is so very clear. But I've learned why Jesus, why the scriptures repeat this warning so regularly. People don't listen. They don't catch on. Jesus refers to the deceitfulness of riches. They have a way of tricking us. As a pastor, I've often had people come to me confessing various sins, but I can think of nobody who has ever come to me confessing to be a lover of money. Interesting. You think you have no problems 
with loving riches. You say, I don't love money. When maybe everything in your life suggests that, well, actually you do. Innocent riches can get a grip on your soul and you never know it, but they can choke away your spiritual life. Beware. Then there are the pleasures. I mean, part of why you like riches, there's two reasons you like riches. One is they provide a certain degree of security. The other is that they uh, can buy you some pleasures, right? So we like the pleasures, amusements, pleasures of life, and so forth, may be fine. They may be fine. (laughs) They may be fine when taken according to directions and in proper doses, but an overdose can destroy. You become a foodaholic. You become an alcoholic. You become a TV junkie. You become a sports junkie. You become a gambling addict. Maybe your thing, maybe your thing is gardening. Skiing, travel, movies, music. (laughs) Could be any number of things. Someone said, uh, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach him to fish, and he'll sit in a boat and drink beer all day. (laughs) That's the way it often goes. More than riches, (laughs) we are a pleasure-plagued generation. Uh, We have more leisure time, more leisure things, than any generation before us, and they are killing many. They are killing many. Jesus never says, don't have fun. No, no, that's an ungodly philosophy. But dear friend, your amusements may be fine when you use them like medicine, but they must never become your food. For many, they are exactly that. You live your life largely for your pleasures, and your spiritual life is choked choked. They're choked. That's the effect these things have on your heart. Thorny's weeds use up all the moisture and all the light. There's no time. There's no money. There's no thought or energy left for God. It's all gone, eaten by the thorns. Now, as uh, many of you know, our, uh, our oldest daughter, Sarah Beth, uh, was, almost died uh, from leukemia, acute lymphocytic leukemia when she was four years old. Do you know what leukemia is? You familiar with that disease and how, how, it, how it works? I wasn't when it happened. Do you know how it kills? It's interesting. Uh, for reasons unknown, they don't know where leukemia comes from or what the cause is or why people get it. They have no idea. But a person's bone marrow starts to produce irregular white blood cells. A- and there's nothing toxic about those white blood cells. They do not hurt you directly. What they do is they take up so much room in the marrow that they crowd out the healthy, disease-fighting white blood cells. Got that? They take up space, and that can kill you. There is only so much room in your bone marrow, only so much time in your schedule. We hear, oh, we hear you have no time for service in the church or for participating in a small group or for private disciplines of prayer and study. No time, you say. Why is that? Well, because you're so busy with this and so busy with that. You're seeking this thrill and you're seeking that pleasure. And again, the question is, what's wrong with that? Nothing in itself, but it will damn you when it becomes king in your heart and your schedule and your budget. Now, you may be alive, I don't know, but you, you look very blue in the face. God, save us from having a choked out Christianity. So many are victims of the thorny three. Worries, riches, pleasures of this life. And again, I say with Jesus, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What is Thorny's problem? It's not that he doesn't like the word. Thorny apparently, in some way, receives the word. He has no difficulties over Christian doctrine. He's fine with the deity of Christ, the message of the atonement, the reality of heaven and hell. He may be faithful in church even. Lots of thornies are in church today. So far, so good. Our problem is worries, riches, 
pleasures of this life. That's what it says. A.W. Tozer put it this way. He says, uh, our problem is that we want God and. You see that? Our problem is that we want God and. Tozer says, in the and lies our great woe. Thorny is a God and type of person. That's what it says. The word came to him. The word grew. The seed and the thorns grew up together. They were both in the soil, which is the very problem being described. Thorny is a Christ and person. And Jesus says to us, that is no good. Now, many don't understand this. Christ is to stand alone in our hearts. He claims exclusive rights. He says in Matthew 10, 37, if you love father or mother more than me, ah, interesting verse for Father's Day, uh, if you love father or mother more than me, uh, you're not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me, not worthy of me. Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters. He'll hate the one or he'll hate the other. He'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. One love must die. The old song, trying to love two, it ain't easy to do. Jesus says, in fact, it is impossible. Some of us are so caught up in cares and riches and pleasures that really any objective assessment of your life would say that's what you're really all about. <laughs> so what's your Christianity? What brings you to North Park Church on a Sunday in June? Is uh, your Christian faith just a little cherry on top of the Sunday of worldly loves? If so, you're choked. Can you see it? You know, I bet your children can see it. You'll take them to church, you'll plant that seed, but you'll spread lots of thorns too that will grow up to eventually kill your son's, your daughter's soul as they sicken yours but we say, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? Nothing. Stop asking that question and see that your innocent loves, <laughs> they can damn your soul. Don't let that happen. Cares, riches, pleasures, they all have a place in your life, but don't let them take the place of Christ. Don't be damned by the innocent. I have two more points. We'll be much briefer on these, so don't worry. The second lesson arising from the account of Thorny is this. You must experience a thorough repentance from sin. The ultimate problem in the thorny ground soil is that at the time of sowing, certain thorn bushes or maybe just their roots were, were allowed to live on in the soil. These were overlooked at the time of sowing. And what's the result of that? At reaping time, there is nothing there together. In the same way, a lack or neglect of thorough repentance in one's heart, maybe at the time of conversion, it will often lead to fruitlessness in one's spiritual life. When you ask what's wrong with my spiritual life, maybe we could trace it back to the very onset of it. The failure to root out old sins in the beginning brings eventual hardship and barrenness. Tolerated lust. Tolerated sins, which to you may seem so harmless, they, they so often grow up to destroy your spiritual life. These little things, as you might see them, you might see them as little insignificant things, but they need to be hated and put away as soon as they are noticed. And listen, you don't deal with spiritual thorns by running the lawn boy over them. You do that, you leave the root right there in the soil. Sin is to be dealt with radically. Ra say that word with me, radically. The word means at the root. It takes more work to get down on your knees and pull out the thorn bush, root and all, but that is what thorough repentance is. I, I mentioned leukemia earlier, and do you know how that disease is being effectively treated nowadays? By the time our daughter got leukemia, the, the cure rate was around 98%. You know, in 1950, it was around 20%. <laughs> so uh, they figured out how to, how to treat it for the most part. They do it through this thing that we call chemotherapy, right? And what does chemotherapy do? 
Chemotherapy, in the case of leukemia, comes in and kills all those irregular white blood cells. That, again, they're not a problem in themselves, but they got to go. Believe me, of course, if you've been through chemotherapy, you know it is not pleasant, is it? Chemotherapy is radical stuff. It makes you sick. And sometimes the treatment for these cancers is greater than the patient can bear. But doctors have found that you cannot play games with cancer. If you don't kill it, it will kill you. So they are willing to make the patient quite sick for a while because in the process of killing off the cancer, they may save your life or at least add some years to it. Now, what happens with some Christians is that we play games. We don't deal vigorously with our sin. We don't deal decisively with it. We don't want to eliminate our sin. We just want to kind of keep it under control. We only deal with the weeds when they're troublesome or when we have company coming over for dinner. We are moderates, afraid to get too religious, so you don't... You don't bathe in spiritual things. You're not interested in getting that clean. You just sort of wet the end of the towel and and wipe off the obvious smudges that sin leaves in your life. Friend, don't just concern yourself with what your kids can see, with what your wife can see, with what your pastor can see. Cut out your sin at the roots, thoughts, motives, those things that only God himself knows about. I tell you, you get serious with your sin, and people are going to think you're strange. <laughs> that, that probably will occur. They'll think you're picky. They'll say, why don't you just cut the weeds? No need to dig deep. But those picky little things can grow up to choke your life. So you get on your knees, and you root it out by a thorough repentance. Al Martin tells the story of a man who was a missionary in Borneo, and it seems that in the tribe where he labored for Jesus, there was uh, demon worship was rife, and their custom in that tribe was to cultivate some plant in honor of their patron demon. And one man in the tribe had done that. He had a plant in the jungle that was dedicated to his... uh, his preferred demon. But then he came under the hearing of the word of Christ. He was disturbed within because he knew that for him, coming to Jesus meant he must dig up that plant in deep heart repudiation of his demonism. And the day came when in great fear, because he was taught that if he ever ever repudiated the demons, their power would come against him. In great fear, he took his missionary friend to that place in the jungle where his plant stood. And with resoluteness of thought, he bent over to that plant and he loosened the soil around it very carefully. He didn't just stomp on the plant and was done with it. He was out to get the whole thing. He dug it up roots and all, and then he walked to a clear place in the jungle, a place where the the bright sun would shine down unhindered, and he, he placed that plant there in the sun, and he and the missionary friend stood and watched it wither under the heat of the sun. Now, I hope you can see the point here. Some of you have only stomped on your sin. Now it's grown up again, and you're fruitless. Maybe you're not a gross sensualist. You may not be a crook, but you're fruitless. No growth in grace, no vital ministry. Brother or sister, you need a thorough repentance from sin. That's where it starts. With God's help, get the thorns out of your life, roots and all. Lesson number three, you must guard your heart with diligence. The sad fact is that weeds and thorns have an awful vitality about them. They are not easy to exterminate. It takes effort. It takes diligence. Neglect your yard and they will grow. Neglect your heart and they will grow there as well. Grace fruit is an exotic. It takes effort. It takes labor. It takes no work at all to grow thorns, right? I I love these places where weeds grow up. I mean, concrete, cracks in the concrete, and weeds will grow up from that. I don't know how that happens. Some of you know this better than I. Any gardeners here? Who would put yourself down as a gardener today? Come on, don't let us share. There are a lot of gardeners. I know some of you like working in in the soil. To get fruit, it takes work, right? 
It takes work. It's the same in the realm of the Spirit. You've got to guard your heart. You have to tend it and cultivate it if you want to see fruit. You'll have to watch your heart, we're told, with diligence. Watch it lest it go after other gods. See to it that that no cares, no riches, no pleasures get their grip upon your soul. Keep checking the direction of your affections. Clean out the clutter, those things that will compete for your time and for your emotions. So we finish with Proverbs 4.23. I think I finished with this verse more than any verse in the history of my preaching. Proverbs 4.23, read it together out loud with me. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. It is the root of what you are, that heart. Make it your chief concern. So what kind of spiritual gardener are you? Most would give no time at all to develop their hearts, and so they bear no fruit. How about you? Our Lord did not give us this parable so we would read about Thorny and say, well, that, that's me, and leave it at that. His purpose is, and my heart's longing, is that you would forsake the things that choke your spiritual life and drain you of your joy and peace and faith and hope. Kill the weeds, roots and all, and develop within you, by grace, a heart that is believing, true, and pure. God forbid that you, after hearing this, God forbid that you should be a thorny soil hearer for even one more day. Take heed. Do not be damned by the innocent. Repent thoroughly from your sin. Guard your heart from this day on. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Father in heaven, we pray that you would work these things in us, that you would, by your Spirit, apply the warnings and the instruction of our Savior, that we would see all the various ways that the enemy can lead us astray and choke our life out. Some things, Lord, that we know in themselves are good and fine and swell, but they've become too big in our lives, and they're choking out the things that matter for eternity. So God, give us courage and grace and a certain ruthlessness to, uh, to purify our souls to eliminate those things that compete for your place in our hearts and where we have sin, Give us, Lord, a, a deep, thoroughgoing repentance from it that we would flee from those things that grieve your heart. And then, Lord, that we would watch over our heart with diligence, asking ourselves day in and day out, week in and week out, about the affection and the direction of our affections. Lord, that they would be more perfectly aligned with yours, that you would become bigger and we would become less, and that the things of this earth would be strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.